Come such a long way, Mijo. One, two, three. Mom, Dad, Mom, Dad, I got it. I got it. Right, Mom. I have. <laughs> How can solar eclipses help avert space weather catastrophe? At UT, I teach physics and astronomy courses. My research background is in heliophysics, which is the study of the sun and its influence on objects in the solar system, including technology like satellites. The largest space weather event on record was the Carrington event in 1859. Richard Carrington was observing sunspots when he saw a bright flash. Less than 24 hours later, Telegraph wires are sparking and catching on fire. There were aurora observed as far south as the Caribbean and compasses were not working properly. During a solar eclipse, we can see the atmosphere of the sun in a way that you cannot see with instrumentation, with telescopes. Scientists can use the data collected during a solar eclipse to validate and improve space weather forecasting models. If a Carrington-like event happened today, it could be disastrous. We could have massive damage to our power grids, which could cause blackouts that last for months. We would have to change the way we live our lives completely. Scientists today still cannot predict that a solar storm will happen before it starts. And so, in a way, we are still like Richard Carrington, watching and only knowing that an eruption is happening when we see it happen in real time. The satellite operators and the power grid managers need accurate forecasts in order to make the best decision to protect those assets. And so any data that we can collect that will improve our space weather forecasting models will keep us all safe. Thanks for joining me today in the lab. Check out the playlist in the description to see more videos from the lab and hit that subscribe button or there will be a space weather catastrophe. <laughs>
easy to pay for. You don't have like a second account you gotta go and pay through. Um, and yeah, you swipe once and then it's all you care to eat for as long as you wanna stay here. One of my favorite parts about Eagle Landing and UNT Dining in general is how accommodating it is to lots of different diets. So as a Muslim student, they offer like a ton of halal options for me. For example, Mean Greens, which is our entirely 100% vegetarian dining hall. They've got, you know, all the vegan options that you can eat. Champs, if you're more into, you know, athletics and, you know, counting your calories, that type of stuff. It's really good, really nutritious, gives you that energy you need. If you have lots of allergen concerns, Kitchen West is your place to go. They're free of the big nine allergens. That's not even mentioning the Campus Chad food court, which beyond having all of the options that UNT has, they also include mainstream fast food retail options for students who are interested in that as well. So now we're going to head over to Bamboo Basil and grab some fried rice. All right, we got our food and now I'm here eating with my two friends, Lucre and Ben. What'd you guys get to eat? Um, I got a hamburger, little old fashioned hamburger with a side of fries. They make them nice and crispy. I really oh, yeah. like the texture. Um, I got some condiments on the side and I made sure to really decorate my hamburger. They have plenty of options. Yeah, and what about you, Lapri? So I got some brunch items like sausage and then eggs. Um, typically get it with ketchup, but I didn't feel like it today. And then um, I got a biscuit and gravy and some pancakes and then a brindle cake. Yeah, it looks really good. Mm -hmm. Y'all ready to dig in? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I gotta say, Eagle Landing knows how to make its food. Really? That's for sure. Mm -hmm. What all did you get on your rice? So, I just get the mixed sauteed vegetables that they have over at Bamboo Basil, and I get it overnight. A nice bed of fried rice, it's really good. And then for dessert, I just got myself a little a little donut. It sounds like, is that a good vegetarian option? Oh yeah, absolutely. They, they do add like quite a bit of soy sauce into it because it's, you know, Chinese food. Yeah. But at least for me, it really adds to the flavor. LaBrie, how about that gravy? That looks really good on those biscuits. Oh yes, it's really, really good. I'm gonna skip my pancakes, so I'm just gonna go to my rainbow cake because it looks really delicious. Oh yeah. How is it? It's really, really good. Oh, yeah. I almost got some, but the cheesecake was calling my name today. Clark Bakery, they always know how to make the best desserts. I don't know what they put in this stuff. Let's go ahead and talk to some other UNC students and see what they think of the food here. It's really good. It looks really good. The, the raspberries are really fresh. Mm -hmm. the, the pesto is really, really good. Obviously, the noodles are gone. Yeah. We're good. It's really good. UNT knows how to make its desserts. Yeah. What did you get? What they also get? know how to make their vegan food, because I'm not really into vegan food, and I tried the tofu here, and it's really good. It's really good. I think the dining halls is probably the best option. Yeah. I feel like it's the best value. It's got the most variety. I've been to other universities, too, and mm -hmm. At least in terms of dining halls, I've had the best experience here. And if you could eat only one thing from any of the UNT dining hall locations, what would it be? Um, I would say the garlic noodles and the chicken. The burgers from Eagle Landing. My favorite spot to eat on campus is Avesta. I guess my favorite spot would be Campus Chat. Yeah. The little area where you can get like pizzas. You can make your own pizzas, like make your own salads. Thank you guys for joining me for my day in the life here at UNT. And thank you, LaPree and Ben, for joining me for some of this amazing food. On that note, I think I'm going to go get some seconds as well. Do y'all want to come? Hey, that's it. See y'all later. How is UNT creating new technologies to get us to Mars? My research at UNT investigates alternative methods for spacecraft air revitalization, particularly removing carbon dioxide from cabin air. 
current technology uh, used in International Space Station employs solid sorbents to achieve this. However, NASA seeks to replace solid sorbents as they have large volumes, uh, high energy usage, and reliability issues in the long term. This is not ideal for long duration deep space journeys such as the Mars mission, where resupplying materials is either very difficult or impossible. One of the alternative technologies under consideration is to use liquid sorbents instead of solid sorbents, such as liquid amine that absorbs carbon dioxide. However, this technology requires separation of liquid and gas phases, which is very challenging in microgravity conditions. We are investigating a system called Vertex Phase Separator, which creates and maintains a centrifugal acceleration to replace gravitational acceleration in a cylindrical volume to effectively separate liquid and gas phases. In other words, when we feed carbon dioxide rich air to this prototype, the swirling liquid amine layer inside absorbs carbon dioxide and thus we get carbon dioxide lean air as an output. As part of its Artemis program, NASA is planning to go to the moon and then to Mars and set up habitation there for such uh, deep space missions which could take nine months or longer reliability and energy efficiency are critically important and that's why we are working on alternative technologies sometimes space technology challenges lead to everyday uses memory foam uh, for example and in this case carbon dioxide removal technologies could also find applications such as carbon dioxide capture in earth's atmosphere that could help reduce global warming and also climate change thanks for joining me in the lab check out the playlist in the description to see more videos from the lab and hit that subscribe button Today I'm going to talk to you about how to apply to the University of North Texas, but why are we here when we could do this on campus? The first step's easy. Apply online at goapplytexas.org or commonapp.org. And don't forget to pay the application fee or request a fee waiver if you qualify. It's important to apply before the priority date to have access to the most financial aid and scholarship awards available as well as housing options. You'll need to submit your final high school transcripts after graduation. You can send them electronically or by mail. Many high schools will send them directly to UNT if you request it. UNT offers millions in scholarships and financial aid each year to help students invest in their education. And once you're on campus, you'll find literally thousands of opportunities for student employment, internships, and more to ensure your investment pays off. And one last step, come see us. We have tours and events happening all the time where you can talk to admission counselors, meet current students, and learn more about everything UNT has to offer here at Denton, Frisco, and online. All right, future eagles, let's soar. Go Mean Green.
Testing. Since there's not as many people in here yet, we're going to try to recruit a few more people before we get started. Um, so we'll probably get started in about like five to seven minutes or somewhere around there.
Hey, thanks everybody for being patient. We're gonna give you a couple more minutes. We've got a few things we're gonna adjust on our slides real quick and then we'll get everything started. In the meantime, I'm up here. I, I haven't given you any sort of presentation or anything like that yet, so I don't know what you'd have questions about. But does anybody have any questions about what we're going to do today, what we're going to see? The sun came back out. That's nice. Yeah? Yes. That's a great question. So what, what he's asking is, is uh, was the eclipse that we had in October, was that also a total solar eclipse or, or was it something else? Or maybe just kind of partial because we only saw it partial uh, from here. Um, I'll actually talk about this a little later, but uh, just to give you an idea, is it's actually different. Um, so what, what, what we had last time was what they call an annular solar eclipse. And we weren't in the path of annularity, so we really only saw a partial anyway. But if we were in the path of annularity, it's still different because the main difference between that and what's happening today is the moon is what it was at its furthest approach from Earth at that time. So it didn't have quite the angular size it needed to cover up the sun and the sky. So you got kind of that diamond ring effect, or not that diamond ring, I'm sorry, that ring of fire effect uh, that they were talking about then where you just got kind of an outer ring of the sun. And that's what we call an annular eclipse. So in that particular case, the moon's umbral shadow, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, doesn't actually reach the surface of Earth. So you don't actually have a line of darkness or, or shadow passing over you. So you don't get nighttime uh, like we did in the other one. So it's a great question. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll answer maybe one or two more, and then I think we'll get the slides up and we'll get started. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, maybe hopefully I'll give you something to ask questions about here in a minute. We'll see. I might be pacing back and forth with this one a little bit. Okay, well, I think we're ready to begin my presentation. Uh, first and foremost, on behalf of uh, UNT at Frisco Landing, uh, the University of North Texas's College of Science, uh, also our physics department, and the astronomy education program, I would like to welcome you all to the Eclipse Over Frisco event. Um, we know you could have been anywhere today. You could have gone anywhere, but y'all chose to do it with us. We really appreciate it. I hope you're going to have a good time. The sun's peaked out. That feels good. It wasn't here earlier for my first one. Uh, so um, I'll go over a few things later on. But I do want to let everyone know uh, that even if it does end up clouding up a little bit, uh, there's still something worth observing. Um, so uh, whenever we get totality, which will happen about 1.41 here, um, if you're looking towards the southwest over here, if it's cloudy, you'll actually be able to see it better, but you'll be able to see kind of the line of darkness or really the moon shadow coming towards us. And if it's cloudy, it's actually easier to see that because it gives something for that moon shadow to project on. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Of course, we still hope it's not cloudy, right? Um, so, so anyway, um, I want to get started with the presentation uh, for you. Um, basically, uh, I've got a quick little presentation for you called Where Does the Sun Go? And we'll talk a little bit about the science behind solar eclipses um, and then some of the different things to expect today. Uh, my name is Ryan Bennett. Uh, I am the director of the Astronomy Education Program. I'm the director of our planetarium and our observatory. Uh, we have a wonderful program. We'd love to have you come out and join us sometimes. We have star parties at our observatory. 
uh, regular planetarium shows, all of that good stuff. And we have a wonderful, wonderful student employees that are very dedicated and passionate about their jobs that really do a great job and kind of prop me up. Um, so what I'd like to do is kind of get started. We'll talk about the eclipse uh, a little bit. Look at that, it worked. It worked too good. I'll probably be making fun of myself half the time here. Um, so anyway, I uh, want to do a quick outline of what we're going to talk about today. I've got an introduction, what's happening? And then after that, uh, we'll talk about uh, what we can observe today. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about why eclipses such as the one today, our total eclipses are so rare. Um, and then finally, I'll talk a little bit about some of the observation activities and some of the other activities we've got going on y'all can enjoy today. Uh, lastly, or not, I guess not quite lastly, but I do want to send a special thanks to everyone. Uh, there's been a lot of hard work that's gone into putting together all of the events uh, that we've done and a lot of dedication from a lot of folks. So I want to make sure and uh, remember all of them and thank them for their work. There's a new thing that we added relatively soon uh, that we're really excited about. Um, so the National Eclipse Blooming Project is actually doing a launch from here. And uh, here in a little while after I'm done with my presentation, Hamesh is going to take over here in a minute. Um, and he's going to tell you a little bit about that. They're going to do a launch here. Uh, they've also got a camera on board as well that they'll be live streaming from. So lots of exciting stuff happening today. Lots of good research. Um, so uh, moving right along, quick introduction. I want to thank you all joining us for joining us for this once in a lifetime experience. Uh, I know that that probably sounds a little cliche because there was a solar eclipse like in 2017 here, right? But it wasn't totality. It wasn't a total, total solar eclipse. To give you a little bit of an idea of how historical this moment is, the last time that the DFW area had a uh, solar eclipse was in 1878, uh, so about 146 years ago. Uh, I don't think any of us were around back then, right? And it's going to be actually 193 years 2317 before the next total solar eclipse passes through our area. To give you a little bit more context there, um, we actually are going to have some other total solar eclipses that you can visit, as you can see. But the next one that really sweeps across the United States the way that this one will doesn't happen until August 2045. There is one in 2023 if you want to go to Alaska. You can see it there. Um, and then there also, I think, is one in Wisconsin in 2044. Might as well wait for the 2045 one. You can travel up to Oklahoma to see totality there. But nonetheless, again, 293 years before the Metroplex, we'll see another one. So this is truly a historic event. Um, just due to the path of this particular eclipse, it goes through a lot of different major cities. Um, it's, gonna, it's considered to be one of the most widely viewed solar eclipses or going to be one of the most widely uh, viewed solar eclipses in history. Uh, the approx approximately 31.6 uh, million people live within the path of totality. And if traffic says anything today, hopefully it doesn't, there's a lot of people that have traveled to this area um, for, to, to watch the eclipse. Um, to give you an idea, though, of the length of this, this is about 9,200 miles of essentially how far the moon's shadow will pass today across the United States. It's not very big. And if you consider how big the moon's shadow is, it's not too bit much. It's about 160 miles in diameter. You're not a lot of surface area at all. Um, so anyway, uh, that's, that's a little bit uh, on an introduction. But let's talk a little bit about what's happening. And let's keep it simple. So I've got a picture here. This is actually of the uh, 2017, the August 2017 total solar eclipse. We only got partial here in the DFW area. Um, you can see the shadow passing over as this gif kind of rolls around. And you can see that's exactly what's happening. That's really all the total solar eclipse is, really, up to a certain extent. It's literally the moon's shadow just making contact with Earth. And whenever that happens, it gets dark during the day. Also, you know, since the moon's got about the same size uh, as uh, the, the uh, sun in our night sky, whenever it's at its closest approach, which it is now, It'll fully cover it up, and of course, it'll look like nighttime during the day. So let's talk about some of the different things that we're going to see. Um, for our location here in Frisco, it will completely cover the sun for 2 minutes and 37 seconds. So we'll have that long of essential darkness. It won't be completely dark. We'll probably see kind of like some sunset. It almost looks like sunsets are all around us. Um, but some things to listen for and some other exciting things is nocturnal animals get really confused. So we might hear crickets. Um, 
and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, um, some other thing is that the moon is much closer to us in October. I think you asked a question a little bit earlier about this. And so that's the major difference between this and the eclipse in uh, October. October, the uh, moon was much further away from us. So it didn't take as, it was, it was kind of at its furthest approach. So it didn't take as much room up in the night sky, and so it couldn't fully cover up the sun. Um, this time, it's closest to Earth. It's really close to what we call perigee. And uh, during perigee, uh, it is actually close enough to fully cover up the sun, and then some, a little bit. So, so that's what we're going to see today, and that's why there's actually really long totality today, is because it's even closer to get a bigger angular size uh, than the sun. So what are we going to be able to observe during the eclipse today? Well, if everything falls right, it won't get cloudy, and we'll be able to take a look at all of these things. The first thing I've kind of already mentioned, you'll see the line of darkness sweeping over us. It's not really darkness sweeping over us, though. It's just the moon's shadow. Um, also, uh, and I don't know if I mentioned this, but just so y'all know where to look for that line, it's going to be coming from that way. So y'all have the perfect view of it over here. You've got a nice hill, and you can look way off into the distance, and you should be able to see it sweep in. The good news is, is if it does cloud up, you should still be able to see that, and even maybe be able to see it substantially better. Um, so some different things we're going to be able to observe uh, during the eclipse. There's this diamond ring effect. There's also these things called Bailey beads. These are two pictures of, of, of both of those things. This is what you get with Bailey beads. This is the diamond ring effect. Both of these occur right before you get to totality and right after you exit totality. Essentially, they're a result of the moon's surface being imperfect, right? The moon's got craters. It's got divots in it. And so all that's happening with Bailey beads is you've got kind of some curved craters here, right here. And then as the uh, sunlight's kind of scattering through that, it gives you these kind of bead kind of sparkling effects. So the, the picture doesn't do it much justice. What you'll be able to see will look really well. It'll look kind of sparkly. You'll see lots of sparkles and stuff. And the diamond ring effect is just kind of that last moment right before you get to totality or right after you exit totality. And they call it a diamond ring simply because it kind of looks like a diamond ring, right? And it'll also be kind of sparkly here on the edge, and you'll get some, some flares there. Um, the last thing that I want you all to take a look for, and this is just, of course, if you're looking towards the sun, make sure you know we handed out solar glasses to everybody. So if you're looking towards the sun, make sure you're wearing uh, solar glasses. But, you know, most of us every day don't look at the sun all the time. So if you're just walking around, you don't need to put on your solar glasses for any reason or anything like that. Um, so um, whenever we get to complete totality, uh, what's going to happen is we're going to be able to view a layer of the sun that we typically can't see from Earth. And that's what we call the solar corona. So have a drink. Um, but basically, if you take a look here, this kind of outer atmospheric layer is a very, very hot layer that we're not able to see very well um, with, 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 when the sun's really bright. But once we block out all of the sun's light, you're going to be able to see that really well. And again, this won't do it a whole lot of justice. It'll be kind of flickering and animated in itself as well. Um, so definitely make sure you make those observations. Something else we'll be able to see if it actually does get dark and we don't have clouds or anything like that, it's quite a bit of stuff because there's a lot of stuff out, uh, a lot of planets out currently right now, and potentially a comet. So this is for the moment of the eclipse. This is if we're facing south here, right? So just so everybody knows, south is this way whenever we're outside. So facing that amphitheater out there, if you're, you're looking out that way. You have the eclipse, of course, going on kind of almost directly at what we call your meridian or just directly, over, uh, directly overhead in your sky. And then if you look over to the east of the sun and moon, you're going to see Jupiter here. Now, I don't think you'll be able to see it with the naked eye, but there's also a comet right by Jupiter. Now, maybe if you grab some binoculars or something like that, you might be able to actually take a look at that comet. And we do have some binoculars outside that we've put some solar filters on. Maybe after, whenever that happens, we might be able to remove them. But one of the things I do want to say uh, more than anything is whenever we get to the eclipse, it's going to happen fast. You know, it's only two minutes and 37 seconds. I wouldn't encourage you to go try to look at stuff through telescopes then or any of that kind of stuff. It's kind of a once in a lifetime experience. I'd encourage everybody to just take it in, right? Um, just like animals are going to react to it differently, you might too. It's going to feel kind of weird. Whenever the eclipse starts happening, even the, the sky kind of starts to look kind of weird. 
and the temperature is going to change a little bit. So it just creates kind of this, uh, this interesting feeling that, that I'd love to encourage everybody to take in. But we will have a telescope set up. If you do want to go look at everything, we've got plenty of stations to look at those at, uh, pinhole projectors, all of that good stuff. Pinhole sh projector during totality is not going to show you much. Uh, it'll be projecting nothing, essentially. Um, but uh, a few other things. Uh, you've also got Venus over here as you look towards the east. Um, so as you look towards the east, Venus is going to be really the brightest thing that will actually pop out as soon as this happens. Venus is the brightest object that's out whenever, uh, besides essentially the, the full moon, uh, which we obviously can't have today because we're in a new moon. Um, we've also got uh, Saturn and Mars you should be able to see. Those are going to be relatively faint, but you might be able to make them out. And this whole line right here, if you trace that out, this is kind of what we call our ecliptic plane, or that's just really the plane of our solar system in the sky. Um, so, so that's a little bit there. Um, just to give you really just kind of the timeline of events to expect, I've got kind of a quick little slide for you to just show you everything. Essentially, whenever I finish this talk here after Kamesh is done and everything like that, we will have begun the solar eclipse. So we'll be actually moving towards our partial solar eclipse. So we'll be kind of in this phase right here where the moon's actually starting to move onto the sun. And then, of course, you kind of progress down until we reach totality. Right before totality, that's where you're going to get those Bailey beads and uh, diamond ring effect. And then right after totality, you'll get that again as well. And then, of course, during totality, you can actually take your solar glasses off, but just for these moments, to look at the sun. And then you can actually visibly see the corona and really get a really good look at the night, uh, dark night sky uh, that we're going to be able to have too. So we'll, we'll be making some announcements whenever that happens. Uh, but the key thing here is, is that Totality is going to begin at 1.41.56. So make sure you're counting seconds, right? Let's just, let's just round that to 1.42. Um, and then uh, maximum, or essentially just kind of we're at the midpoint of the eclipse, that's going to occur about 1.43.15. And then totality ends at 1.44.33. So basically at about 1.42, you could take off your solar glasses, take a look. And then probably about 1.44, just go ahead and toss them back on, just so you don't hurt your eyes or anything like that. But definitely do that and take a look. Uh, we'll probably we'll be making some announcements at that time, too. But if you're watching along, those will be the times. It'll also be kind of obvious to you when it happens, because you'll see that darkness sweep in as well. And it'll sweep off the same way that it sw swept in. But it's, it's hauling. It's going really quick. So you're going to have to pay really close attention to, to catch it. So be looking that way. Um, so partial is going to begin, like I said, right, uh, right after we get wrapped up here. And then uh, partial is going to end about 3.03 today. So everything's going to kind of wipe off and everything will be all wrapped up uh, after that time. Sometimes I can get this to work. Okay, there we go. Um, so the, the other thing that I want to talk about a little bit is why these uh, total solar eclipses are rare. Right? So, you know, you heard me start this off. You know, this is kind of a once in a lifetime experience. Okay, maybe I'm selling it, maybe I'm not. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there really is a whole lot of things that really have to line up to make one of these things happen. Uh, there's essentially three key things. One of them is the easiest thing it happens once a month. We have to have a new moon, right? So the moon has to be directly between the Earth and the Sun. So that happens once a month. You know, why don't we have eclipses every month? I'll get to that here in a second. Um, the next thing is something I've already mentioned a few times, especially during like questions and answers as well, is uh, the moon needs to be near its closest approach. There's a video at the bottom that I'm trying to get to play. Can you, can you hit that video for me? Um, so the moon also be, needs to be near its closest approach, or what we call perigee, just so it can be close enough to fully cover up uh, the sun in the sky. And uh, essentially, uh, this only happens, uh, this, this happens, you know, it's got a, it's got a, a long orbit, and you can, we, we can do that. OK, I think we've got that there. And this is going to show that for us here in a little bit. Now, what this does is this kind of ignores that the moon is orbiting around the Earth, and is just showing how the distance changes, right? So the moon's got an elliptical orbit. It's not a complete circle, which means that sometimes it's a little closer, sometimes it's a little further away. Um, and basically, whenever it's a little bit closer, it just helps give us that shadow. It helps its umbral shadow reach us, uh, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit later on in the next slide, I think. Um, the moon also must perfectly align with Earth's orbital plane. So this is really the most important thing, and this is really what makes it kind of the most, uh, 
it makes it a little bit tougher for it to happen. Uh, essentially, the moon's orbit uh, tilt is, is tilted to Earth's orbit by about five degrees. And so what this does is this actually creates two places where you can only get the alignment you need, right, for every single Earth orbit, or for every single uh, moon orbit there is. So basically, this creates something that we call eclipse seasons. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more, I think, uh, on the next couple of slides. But the most thing, the most important thing is your location matters, right? Um, you must be within the path of the moon's shadow. Whenever there is a lunar eclipse, so Earth's shadow on the moon, everybody can see it because Earth has a huge shadow, right? Um, but the other way around, the moon's got a much, much smaller shadow. In fact, at best, it's about 160 miles wide, and that's whenever it's at its very closest approach. Um, and it can still vary a little bit then, and we always usually try to pretend like it's, you know, a circle. It's really more kind of oblong and stretched out. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's not very wide. If you kind of think about it, I said earlier, the eclipse path today is about 9,200 miles, right? So the surface area you're looking at it is about 9,200 miles by about 160 miles. Whenever you consider that and compare that to the surface of the Earth, it's not very much. There's not a lot of people that are going to be able to view it. The other thing you also have to consider is that most of the Earth is water, and most of the Earth's surface is water. So a lot of the times total solar eclipses happen, we don't even see them because they're in the ocean. Or if you look at that last picture that I showed, actually that was a total solar eclipse from a cruise ship. So people do that too. They take eclipse cruises. Um, so uh, next thing I want to talk about is just a little bit about the moon and its shadows. This is actually really, really simple. There's not too much to it. The moon's basically got two different types of shadows. It's got what we call its umbral shadow. That's this really dark shadow you can see right here. And then it's also got what we call its penumbral shadow, uh, which is this kind of much lighter shadow. The main difference between the two is the umbral shadow actually completely blocks all of the light from the sun. So if you're in the path of the umbral shadow, you see totality if it's reaching Earth. If you're in the path of the penumbral shadow, the sunlight's only partially blocked. So you see a partial solar eclipse. And that's really what we saw last time in October. That was what we got, was partial. We weren't even in the path of annularity. But in an annular, the umbra actually doesn't reach the Earth's surface. So you don't actually see the shadow. Um, so that's, that's all on the shadows. The other thing that's probably the most complicated thing to understand is this. So I'll spend a little bit more time on this slide. Uh, the moon's orbit, like I said, it's tilted by five degrees to Earth's orbit. So what this shows you is this is kind of just kind of an oblique view or kind of a side view. So, so these things are just, this is Earth's orbit here that's conveniently in blue for us. Um, and then we've also got uh, the moon's orbit here as well. So this angle right here is just five degrees. It's separated. And whenever I'm talking about a node, I'm talking about where Earth's orbit and the moon's orbit crosses, right? And so that's actually really happening right here, right? So literally the moon has to be on this side of the sun here or on the other side of the sun there for you to get an eclipse. So that can only really happen about two times a year uh, within Earth's orbit. Um, this will kind of illustrate it for you, I think, substantially better. Um, so what you can see here is, of course, you've got the Earth's orbit here, and then you've got the moon's orbit laying on that orbit, and it's tilted by about five degrees, right? So these points running across here, they're analogous to this point right here in the center. These are your nodes. This is where you get that perfect alignment where you just happen to be in the point in Earth's orbit where it also lines up with the moon's orbit. Um, so in these particular cases, if you look at it, you can actually see for a lunar eclipse, which happens, of course, whenever there's a full moon, you've got Earth's shadow fully projecting on the moon. And then for the alignment that we need, a new moon here, where the uh, sun is, uh, the moon is in between the Earth and sun, you can see that this is actually projecting on Earth, right? Because we have the alignment we need in these two situations. Whereas we look at these other two extreme situations, we can't get that, right? So in this situation, uh, it's five degrees higher, and so the moon shadow is projecting over the Earth, right? And then in this situation, it's lower, so the moon shadow, or really, I guess for a full moon, the Earth's shadow is not projecting uh, onto the moon. So really, you've got to have this kind of perfect alignment here. Throw in something that's a little bit more complicated. The moon's orbit processes. So that place where they meet changes. I'll kind of try to show you with my hands. It basically does this. So if this is the orbit, it moves around like that. And so that makes it even really more complicated, and that's why it's so hard to predict these things. And it took us so long to figure this out. 
Um, but anyway, that kind of should give you a really good idea of, of why these things are so rare. Lastly, I got lazy, so I recorded this from last, NASA last night. Um, this is a really cool picture of just showing you everything that's happening today through the uh, eyes on the solar system app that NASA has. So you can see the umbral shadow here is the darker part, right? And then this is the penumbral shadow. So that umbral shadow is showing you the path of totality, essentially, which you can also see by the darkest line here. But everything else that you see, like this region right here is getting a 50% partial. Anywhere that you see that, that shadow passing is getting a, a partial solar eclipse. So the entire United States is essentially getting a partial, at least today. Uh, but you just happen to be in a place where you'll be able to see uh, totality. So that's kind of what our path is. And that's kind of, again, the most important thing if you want to be able to see totality is, is being in that, in that narrow path that the moon's going to travel through. So one of the last things I really want to talk about is just some activities I think would be awesome if y'all could check out today. And hopefully, you know, the sun stays out and everything like that, and there'll be plenty of activities to do. We've got several stations to set up. Uh, for me, my favorite station that we're going to have is the Hydrogen Alpha Telescope, where you can do some chromosphere observations. So that's going to be right out here on the lawn, kind of that way. Trace is manning that up. Um, that, is, that uses a very special filter that uses a very narrow band of red light only. It only looks in that very narrow bandwidth because that is where all solar activity lies. It's a very special line that only hydrogen gives off. So whenever you look at the sun in that wavelength, you see what we call the chromosphere, where there's a lot of magnetic field activity. There's a lot of uh, solar flares that you might be able to observe. These, these, these little things called spicules that just kind of like look like little fur balls coming the sun and they're kind of animated. So you get to see that and then you also get to see the eclipse. And as the moon moves over it, sometimes that allows you to see more detail on the sun too. So that'll be a really cool thing to check out that's one of the coolest uh, solar telescopes we have. Uh, we also have white light observations. These are going to be with Dobsonian telescopes. We have those set up in pairs outside. Um, there's about three different stations with these. Y'all can check those out. Uh, one of them's fitted with an eyepiece, so you can just look directly through the telescope. We've also made these cool little sun funnel things that'll allow you to just go look at the telescope, and you can just see the eclipse right there in front of you. Um, I want to thank Trace for making those. He did a great job uh, getting that taken care of for us. Um, then uh, we've also got a space-time general relativity demo that's just right out here in the center. Something you might not know is that in 1919, uh, a guy named Eddington, or really what was called the Eddington, Eddington Experiment, uh, verified uh, Einstein's predictions of general relativity. This is essentially what made general relativity popular. And if you don't know what this is, go visit Joe. He'll tell you a little bit about relativity at the space-time demo that we have. Um, just to give you kind of a real quick explanation, though, general relativity says that matter bends space and time, right? And essentially, having a solar eclipse presents the best occasion to test this because the sun's the most massive thing in our solar system, right? But during the day, we can't see stars. Well, there's one point in time during solar eclipses where we can see stars and the sun at the same time. So if we look at stars that are very close to the sun whenever the total solar eclipses happen, we can measure the angular displacement of their light and we can calculate the mass of the sun. Um, this is gonna be happening all across the world today. People are going to be viewing the eclipse here, sending the data somewhere else. They're going to be re-verifying this theory all day, along with lots and lots of other exciting research, including the research uh, that we're going to have a uh, presentation on here in just a moment. Uh, we've also got sunspotters and pinhole projectors. I'll let you go visit those stations to figure out what those are. But basically, you can project the eclipse and look at it on the ground instead of actually looking uh, through your glasses, if you like. In addition to that, just go look at the trees later on. If you look at the little holes through the trees, especially as we get closer to maximum, you're going to see little eclipses projected onto the ground. It's going to look really cool. Um, we've also got Globe Citizen Science. For any of you all that were aspiring scientists that want to take some data and actually contribute to research, the Globe Citizen Science table is a great place to do that. There's an app you can download, and you can take some different measurements for us during the eclipse, including temperature measurements. There's going to be temperature changes throughout the day to day. And even if you're not going to take any measurements, it might be worth actually going and checking out how that changes at these stations uh, that are also set up at the Sunspotter stations as well. Um, then we're really excited about the CLIPS research. Hamesh is going to talk about that in just a moment. I'm going to hand that over to him. Um, we've also got a CLIPS trivia here in here with prizes. Uh, that's going to 
but at 2.15, uh, we just asked for a donation of $5, and that'll get you entrance to trivia. And then we've got some really cool prizes that the president's office actually bought us for this specifically. First off, we've got an over $1,000 unistellar telescope. It's a fully digital telescope. Um, it's great, it's a really great prize to have. Uh, it'll take, it'll do astrophotography, you name it. Um, the only thing they're not super great at is doing planets, but you can't get solar filters on them and you can use them for the sun. Um, then we have an eight inch Dobsonian telescope. Um, that's a Celestron, good uh, solid name brand telescope. And then we also have a tabletop Dobsonian telescope for third place. And then we have some meteorites for the places below, so some small micrometeorites. So if you all want to participate in that, it'll be a lot of fun, lots of cool prizes. Ashley's going to be doing that for us a little bit later on. Um, then finally, uh, we've got a literature reading, I think from one to two, same place where the jazz team's playing. And we also have a jazz, uh, jazz group that's out here as well. And of course, we've got food out there and everything like that. Um, so. Um, I think that's mostly it for me. The last thing and probably the most important thing, I just want to send a thank you out to everybody that really made all of this stuff possible. Lots of hard work went into this over the last four or five months. Um, I want to thank the UNT President's Office for all of the coordination that they were able to do with us and all of the help that they were able to give us, including those prizes that I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, the UNT Frisco Landing Team, Rachel Grimes, Steven Sparkman, been awesome, helped coordinate all kinds of stuff here. The UNT College of Science, that's kind of my home, or really, I guess, the UNT Department of Physics. Um, and then also, uh, all of the wonderful volunteers that we have today. And in addition to that, um, all of my wonderful astronomy education program staff. Uh, they make it worth it all of the time. And then finally, my beautiful wife. She's right there. She put up with me the last four or five months. I'm getting all this stuff going. Um, so I think that's it for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to the balloon team. I really hope you all all have a, a wonderful eclipse. I'll be walking around the entire time while this is going on. If you have any questions, please feel free to find me. I'm happy to answer any questions you all might have. Um, and again, thanks for joining us. Habesh. So just now Ryan gave a wonderful presentation, even, um, even being at UNT. I still don't know a lot of things about Eclipse, but this is excellent informative, excellent information. So while you are coming, you might have seen a couple of uh, balloons being filled up with uh, helium. So we are going to talk about what they are, what they are going to do. Um, first of all, um, there are the, I'm teaming with uh, Penn State University professors and uh, Kennesaw State, Georgia State, but the balloons are launched by primarily Penn State University and uh, uh, Lincoln University together. And then it's one of the probably 50 plus balloons that NASA is sending exactly during this total solar eclipse to do a bunch of experiments. And uh, uh, we are going to show you one by one each, each payload and what they are for. And uh, Austin is going to talk about that. Um, and then UNT also is sending a payload. And thanks for uh, facilitating this. Thanks for allowing us to do. Uh, it, uh, that we are sending a device. Uh, it's called RF scanning. RF stands for radio frequency. So we want to look at, or we want to measure the all variety, different kinds of electromagnetic or uh, radio frequency signals. You know, when you say radio frequency signal, think about like your cellular phone or Wi-Fi. You know, those are RF signals. Um, so obviously, from the ground, when the balloon is going up, um, maybe for up to a few hundred feet, you're going to see cellular signals. But afterwards, you may not get the cellular signals, right? So what, what, what other kinds of signals you can think about that you can see? Satellite signals, um, primarily satellite signals. And sometimes, you know, some sort of atmospheric disturbances also might turn into some sort of RF signals. So, so we are going to detect, we're going to measure variety of signals at various altitudes. Remember the balloon actually, is, the two balloons are going all the way up to 70,000 feet. Um, so the RF scanning device was built by a company called SpectreEdge. Um, some of my friends are watching. Uh, so thanks to SpectreEdge for giving that device. And we are going to talk about the other payloads that Penn State University and Lincoln University are, uh, are, 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 are adding. So this is Austin. He's an um, undergrad student from Penn State University, and he will showcase different payloads. He will explain the different payloads. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so 
As an overview, again, um, NEBP, we have a lot of universities that are sending atmospheric balloons and engineering balloons up into the atmosphere during the eclipse. Um, the one that we're sending today is part of the engineering track. And uh, I'm going to tell you about a lot of the payloads that we have and their purposes. You can turn the signal on the next, next slide. Oh, next slide. Uh, so we are sending two high altitude balloons for today's launch. Uh, one of which is going to be uh, measuring gravity waves. Um, and that is uh, done by a module that was sent to us by NASA, part of the uh, uh, ballooning project. And um, that's on a payload called the pterodactyl. And we're able to measure that potentially from the fast moving shadow of the moon during the eclipse. And another payload that we'll have is Lincoln's payload, and that's going to be detecting gamma rays during the eclipse. And during, or for the second balloon, we have a Gerdian condenser. And that basically will allow us to measure the changes in ion uh, conductivity in the stratosphere. Um, and we also have our uh, radio frequency scanner as well. So one of the most important payloads on our balloon is the Iridium. Uh, this payload connects to the Iridium satellite constellation. That's a group of satellites that allow our balloon to be tracked, it's a bunch of GPS satellites. And that's tracked by our ground station, which I'll show later. Um, we're also able to uh, look up this actual module on the internet and kind of see a flight path of where it's going, what its altitude is, what its speed is, and all that. And this is also important because it receives commands to our vent and cut down payload. And that allows us to control the balloon height and um, cut down the payload whenever it is needed. So this is our video camera payload. This is what uh, is going to be live streaming our launch. Um, it has two 190 degree fisheye lens cameras, one on this side, one on that side. Uh, those are done through the Raspberry Pi, which is in here, housed right there. Um, it uses the Ubiquiti network to stabilize connection with our ground station. And that Ubiquiti module is right there in white. It's the tall one. Um, uh, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Can you go back? So this video that is being recorded is stored on an SD card that we'll be able to pull out later. Um, and we got, we got about four hours of data last time that we tested this, so it runs pretty long. So this is our vent and cut down. There's two big parts. One is that blue nozzle right there. And then we have our actual vent uh, payload right here, plus the parachute. So the blue nozzle helps us actually fill our balloon. So the bottom of the balloon is attached to the top of the nozzle. And that top nozzle is attached to this top part of the payload. And we have a tube that's connected into this gray uh, part right here. And that's how we're uh, regulating our uh, balloon filling. And also, in this area, there's a lid. Oh. OK. Uh, before. After? Yeah. So there's a lid right there under that you can't really see it, but it's in this module. That is the flap that kind of controls how fast the air is coming out of the helium balloon whenever we are controlling its altitude. Um, there's also a hot wire that is used to cut down the balloon. It's in a box behind here. 
And afterwards, the parachute will deploy whenever the payload is cut down. So this is our RFD 900 payload, and this is a GPS module that can also send down orientation data and other altitude and speed data to our ground station. And that is, uh, the signals are being received by a gritty antenna, which I will talk about later. Uh, this is our pterodactyl. It's a pretty long acronym. Um, it's a scientific, this is the, our scientific module provided by NASA. And the way it measures those gravity waves that I talked about before is it has a barometer um, in one of those uh, circuits. And that'll change. And uh, the pterodactyl will detect, detect that change whenever it's in the air and it experiences potential bobbing up and down. And it also has a built-in menu where we're able to see the temperature of the air, the pressure of the air, and um, everything else. So this is our Gerdian condenser. Um, this is what's going to be used to uh, detect ions in the atmosphere and uh, determine their conductivity changes. Um, it also has a housing right here. And this giant cone on top is needed to increase the airflow so we're able to uh, increase like the sensitivity of its measurements. This is the ubiquity antenna. This is what is pointing towards the iridium payload. Uh, this is set up on a ground station right now, and it is controlled automatically by a software called BRAD. And then this is our gritty antenna. This is manually controlled, and um, this is what receives data from the RFD 900. Um, yeah. So, um, so thanks, Austin, for a wonderful tour of all the devices. Um, yeah. So if you're interested in seeing the payload, it's out on the, that side of the building. Um, you can come by and see that. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments here just about um, the appreciation that I have for uh, UNT in hosting us. Um, so uh, uh, Penn State is in the center of Pennsylvania. We're not in the path of totality, and this part of the year we usually have lots of clouds. And so I was promised a clear day, so I'm going to still hold on to that. Um, and this down here was in the path of, of totality. Uh, Kamesh has been a colleague of mine for a long, um, a long time on a number of different things we've worked on. And when I looked at the path of totality and I said, wait, it goes right near Denton. And then he said, we actually have a brand new facility in Frisco, which is in the path of totality. So it worked out perfect. One of the things about engineering and science is the collaboration that's needed. And then one of the things that we do as educators is make sure that we basically educate the next generation here in essentially how to do um, the types of research that is impactful research. And so we appreciate all of those that have sponsored us and then the great hospitality that's been down here. So thank you, Kamesh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sven. Um, I have, uh, in fact, we are a faculty. Now this is, uh, I just asked uh, uh, Sumit say, to say one word uh, and then followed by Dr. Ashwin Ashok from GSC. We're yes. all working together in some of the experiments. So go and see the go and see the balloon launch from beginning to end. It starts at one o'clock. So balance between yeah, you, yeah. At, at right here on the on the right side of the entrance, right right entrance at one o'clock they take off, uh, and then you're going to see live video from way up above the clouds, up to, all the way up to seventy thousand feet. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kamish. Thank you, Kamish, for hosting us and for allowing us to be here and participate in this experiment. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ashwin Ashok. I'm representing Georgia State University in this experiment. I really thank uh, UNT, um, uh, Dr. Kamesh and Sumitha, long-time collaborators, and the moment uh, Sven and his team, Penn State, uh, allowed us, gave us some room for uh, doing some experiments in this wonderful initiative uh, on, a, on this historic day. <laughs> Uh, we are very happy to run some experiments that Kamish mentioned about sensing. 
And once we have the data, we'll be happily sharing with you all, all what we learned. Thank you again. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Penn yeah. State. All right. Thank you, everyone, for helping us. You know, go and enjoy outside. Watch the balloon. Watch the live stream from, coming from the balloon. And uh, have fun. Thank you.
Sunshine of my life, I think, is up. Uh, yeah, but guess what? Can what? we do here comes? Yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. We're hanging on, John. Let me, let me get it out. What are you getting out? Um, moon glow. Moon glow. It's in the back here. Which one? Moon glow. And if you don't have it, let me know. Sunshine of my life. Are you ready? Well, it's disappointing because I can't sing it. Be quick. What, your mic doesn't work? It's probably some minor thing in the readout that I'm not going to have to go. Does your mic, local mic work? This mic is.
John Denver thing. Okay, so okay, you got some instructions on this one, John? Uh, let's see. Do we start at C or something? No, we just read the chart down. Uh, Except for the repeat. There's a repeat at C. Oh, see. that's right, that's right. The, the, the C is uh, repeated. Eight bars.
were supposed to take a break. Now. Yeah, something's happening up there. Um, so kind of put that music back in the same order, and we can start doing the same thing next time. Oh. Put it back in the. You got a set list in oh, the front. Yeah, in, in bird order. Because <laughs> that's how I have it. Yeah. Well, if you want to, we can do that. Yeah. In retrograde, yeah. I mean, that's very. Uh, it works for me. It's not amazing. It's not that way. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Here comes the sun. Hey! We're going to start playing again. I'm telling you, you guys. Oh, hello! Hi, baby. Hi. You guys are awesome. Thanks. All right. I thought of a great tune on the sunny side of the street. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's in the. It's in the other book. Let's do Here Comes the Sun first. It's in the blue book. Probably is in the morning sun. No, no. Testing one, two. That's good. Okay, what are we doing? Let's do Here Comes the Sun. Here Comes the Sun. Oh, here not, comes. not very long. All right. And then, and then, oh. and then start over. Yeah, we could. Sunshine has your sunny side of the Hello. Um, I really enjoyed y'all's music. It was great. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. We're gonna play again. We're gonna play until 2:45. Oh wow. Well, probably be our chance to go. So that's oh. why I was telling you. Oh that yeah. Really okay. Well, that was pretty exciting, huh? Yes, it was. Yeah. It's something you can hey put on your list as special. <laughs> Yeah. That well, you experienced. I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you. you Appreciate it. Okay. I, my, my appointment is actually at 3, so I'm probably going to have to leave a little sooner. Oh, okay. So you, what, what do you want to do? You want to take a hey, picture now? When the bass player gets here. Yeah, when he gets here, we can yeah, take a we'll picture now. We'll put our now. glasses on. Yeah. yeah. Put your glasses I'm John, by the way. Hey, John. John you know, yeah. 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 I've been taking a couple pictures of y'all, so I'm going to go over to you. What's the name of the guy you studying with? Uh, Gary Kasinski. He's from, he's from uh, Northern California. He's part of Keep Up Okay. okay. Glasses on and let him take a picture. 
Once I put these glasses on, I can't see anything. <laughs> so let me know. Like yeah. one, two, three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you all one, two, three. On. Put them on. We're going to take a picture of the Eclipse Band. Yeah. Eclipse yeah. Band. So grab those So if you, um, if you just want to move, like, need to stand sorry. up? Does he need to stand yeah, up? Yeah, so if I could, y'all could just stay close to y'all instruments. Um, I'll Where have you move they? a little bit to your yeah. Yeah. right there. Okay. A little bit more. And then I should be able to get all y'all in here. Is that it? Take the lens off. That would help the lens down. All right. And then we're gonna put our bass player here. I'm gonna give you a one, two, three. All right. Y'all ready? All right. Give him the sunshine. Y'all ready? Here we go. One, two, three. I'll do one more. Here we go. One, two, three. Yeah, no problem, no problem. All okay. right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Appreciate you, man. Of course. Okay. Thanks, Of course. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. All right. Can we do it again? We're not going to take this very long. Here comes the sun. Da, 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 oh, that's a little slow, isn't it? That's why I'll always be around 
the apple of my eye. Oh yeah, forever you stay in my heart. You are the apple of my eye. Oh yeah, but if you.
Let's try with three. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 it's alphabetical. I'm going to do sunny side of the street for you. Oh, good. I say I'm from New Do you know the words? <laughs> you can't sing then. No, I don't That's know. Better. Ready, guys? Yeah. Steve's got to get the right uh, tonality.
what do you want to play? John, pick one. A-Train. A-Train.
take an A-train <laughs> to, to Denton. Take the A-train to Denton. A-train for Denton. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about let's do Perdido? Okay. What book? Blue? Uh, I think, let me look. Back up to this one. Everybody knows that one anyway. Oh, you know what? Let's do, uh, what's that, uh, that blues, uh, Doxy. Let's do Doxy. It's in the green book. Doxy. Oh, that's good. Twelve in front. Twelve in front. Twelve bars in front. How about eleven and three quarters? Oh, 
All right, look out here. You've come such a long way. One, two, three. Mom, Dad. Mom, Dad, I got it. I got it.
15 minutes ago. Come right down here. Oh, you want to do that? Yeah, it's a wall. Just change the pace. Oh, we didn't do it softly at the morning sunrise. Yeah, we'll do that after this. Okay. No, that's next. I think it's in. I'll, I'll find out where it's at. Oh, I know. Yeah. It's in the same book as Sunnyside. Right behind you. Yeah, right there. Oh, you learned to do that. Yeah, right there. 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 Yeah, I know, it's for the insecure, as they always say. <laughs> I can't wait to hear that. But one of these days, yeah. trust me, it, it will happen. What's she going to do? I'm learning the accordion. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Hey, exactly. In 15 minutes, my horn is going to melt in the sun. So let's go. Oh, Tommy will be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> be my last gig. <laughs> You want to want to vamp a, a Can't few afford words a, another Mark Six. <laughs>
Well, let's do it. That was in the green book. Right? I just saw it in the book. It's, it's in the green book. It's um, hundreds of dollars. What temple would this be, Mark? You want to figure the temple thing? Yeah. No. It's right around here. It's right here. It's pretty fast, right? It's down. Uh, there's no, there's no uh, intro on this, so we can do a vamp.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Shelby, and I'm a student at UNT. I'm a sophomore this year, and I'm studying business economics, and I thought it would be fun to bring you guys along for a day in the life. For my future college students out there, this is what I bring to class daily. What you'll probably most likely definitely need is if I can open the <laughs> Another must-have for a college student is some kind of laptop. I've seen people um, use iPads as well, but um, for me, this is my baby. This is where all of the work gets done. Since I'm a business student, it's also always helpful to get yourself a graphing calculator. And depending on what classes you take, if you're going to need to take notes or if you could do it on Google Docs, etc. But those are the essentials. Um, UNT allows you to bike ride to class, to skateboard, and there's even those electric scooters that people zoom by me past or Zoom past me with, um, but today I'll just be riding my bike. If you live in off-campus housing or like at Victory, like me, um, they have bus schedules that will take you to whatever building you need to get to on campus. All right, let's go. Yeah. 
Hey guys, I just got back from my B-Law class. I'm still in the BLB, or the Business Leadership Building. Um, and one thing I wanted to talk about is how much I really like the class sizes at UNT. Um, they're a lot more comfortable than I've heard of other universities. And even in my larger classes, the professor still makes sure that he's speaking directly with students and there's a lot of participation going on in those classes. Um, so I really appreciate that you feel heard. One thing that's very important to keep track of in college is just trying to stay organized throughout all of your classes with all of your extracurriculars and other obligations that you have to keep track of. I really enjoy the calendar feature on Canvas because it lays out all of the assignments that your professors have due for basically the entire semester and you can get a head start and look to see what those weeks are going to look like in the following weeks. <laughs> There's a way that you can actually take the Canvas calendar and integrate it into your Google calendar. So what I do is to keep track of all my classwork, my work schedule, my outside extracurriculars, I'll take my Canvas calendar and put it into my Google calendar so I have all of my calendars in one area that I can look at. Another thing that I really appreciate um, about UNT is that all of my professors so far have been really great with communicating. And if I ever have been struggling in a class, they're always going out of their way to make sure that I understand the concepts that they're teaching. Whether that be me going to office hours or them offering me um, outside help, outside of office hours, um, they're always really good at communicating and they care about seeing the students succeed. My favorite study spots on campus, one would have to be the Willis Library, of course. They have four stories, it's open 24-7, so that's always the first option that me and my friends go to. Um, the second would probably be the BLB. I love this building, the architecture is just so nice. And the third story is always really quiet and peaceful up there. It's kind of like a maze back here because this is where the business professor's offices are. But if you can hear, it's super quiet and peaceful. <laughs> So this is where I always go. Don't everybody come up here all at once because then I won't be able to find seating. <laughs> if all else fails, the dorms always have really nice study rooms, mostly in every hall. Um, so there's lots of areas and resources that you can go to if you need to crunch for a test. A lot of students also don't realize that we have a writing center, a math lab. Those resources were very helpful for me whenever I was struggling in those classes, especially calculus. Don't be afraid to ask for help. They have one-on-one -on -one tutoring um, and they're really, really great if you need the help. You don't have to worry about trying to accommodate your really busy schedule. If you have time after class one day, you can just drop by and ask for help on a question that you had a question about and it's really great. And lastly, what I've come to love about UNT that nobody could have really explained to me beforehand it's just the sense of community and the people at the university. And I think that is what has made my experience um, stand out like it has because it was really easy to find people that I clicked with and people that we can uplift and support each other, um, whether that be in clubs that I'm in or um, just people I've met in class. Everybody here has been very welcoming um, and it's really good to have that community and tight-knit family feeling that UNT provides. Thank you all for coming to class with me today and I hope to see you guys soon on campus. Go Mean Green. <laughs>What's up guys, this is Cody Winkler on the UNT men's golf team. Today I'm gonna to take you on a day in my life at UNT. Let's go. Morning everybody. Just woke up bright and early. It is 5.05 in the morning. Uh, to start my day, I usually do a little Devo in my Bible uh, out on the back porch. After that, on Tuesday and Thursday, we have team workouts as well as Friday mornings. All right, so now we're walking into the facility. We've got Coach Calcaterra here, ready to work out. Let's get it. We're gonna go get a good lift. So this morning was like a CrossFit workout. We did what's called an EMOM, every minute on the minute. Just finished up the workout. Now the boys are heading to get the protein shakes. 20 years ago, college golf teams probably didn't work out. And now we work out three times a week. The biggest reason I chose UNT was um, it's not too far from home. The facilities are unbeatable. I mean, we have a top three facility in, in the country between Brezzy's, Merido Golf Club, and Denton Country Club. There's not a thing we're missing that the highest ranked program has that we don't. 
All right, guys, this is Bruzzy's, our on-campus practice facility. It's named after Bruzzy Restheimer. He's our big sponsor. Let's go for a tour. So, guys, this is our main entrance with a few trophy cases. We got a bunch of trophies in here from conference championships. And then back here, we got the same thing with all of our accomplishments. All right, guys, so this is a big living room area with a, a big, big half circle couch you can fit the whole team on. So here I am with the photos. Uh, there's a pretty cool guy right here. It's Cody Winkler, he's pretty good. So this is my favorite part of the facility, the kitchen. Uh, Kayla, our nutritionist, does a great job of keeping it stocked every week. We've got everything we need with healthy snacks and foods and electrolytes to power us through practice. This is our putt view room. This is probably the coolest thing in the facility. Um, it helps us work on our putting because it has sensors in the ceiling that shine down and show the line into the hole. This is our TrackMan hitting bay. It's got a TrackMan in it so we can track all of our numbers, shots, and everything. There's a wall, another job for that. So this is a big simulator. We have force plates on the ground right here to let us know where our balance is throughout the golf swing. So the last thing I wanna show you is our outdoor facility. It's pretty cool, let's go check it out. All right guys, this is our outdoor driving range with all of our hitting targets out here. They range from 20 yards all the way out to 300 yards. We got a big tee area right here. We've got a chipping green over there. Over here is our big putting green. Uh, we've got everything we need to be the best player we can be. After practice, I have class Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at 2 o'clock and 3.30. What's up guys, it's 3 o'clock, so it's time to head across campus to Sage Hall for my 3.30 lecture. On Tuesdays, I have what's called Bass 3020, Inquiry and Discovery. The reason I chose Bachelor of Arts in Applied Sciences, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I chose it because I could focus on two different things. Uh, between kinesiology and sports management. I loved learning about the body and the fitness side of things and physical therapy and kinesiology, but I also wanted to know how to manage sports. And so sports management was a big part of it so I could learn that side of just athletics in general. One of the things that's great about UNT is the professors are extremely helpful. Being on the golf team, I miss a lot of class for tournaments and, and events, and they're super understanding and, and willing to work with us on days we're out, um, taking exams early or late just helping us out in, in whatever way they can since we're not able to be there all the time. And it's, that's big for me because I was at a, another university where it wasn't always like that. Um, and the fact that they're willing to help us out here and work with us uh, throughout the season is huge. In the evening, after everything slows down, uh, I cook every night, um, usually something simple like chicken. It's important to me to cook my own food because I know what I'm putting in my body, make sure my plate's full. Uh, no vegetables though. The only green in my life is the mean green. You know, it's been, I've been up since five in the morning, worked out, practiced, um, so I'm pretty tired. I just kind of rest, do some homework, and then usually my roommate Tucker and I will finish the night with some ping pong. Uh, we love playing ping pong, it gets really competitive. Four left. Guys, thanks for joining me on a day in my life at UNT. Hope you enjoyed seeing the facility and everything I do as a student athlete here. You gonna go another round? You bet. Balls down here. Yeah. <laughs>my name is Sierra Simon and I'm with the UNT women's softball team and today I'm going to be taking you on the day in my life. Go Mean Go Green! green. <laughs>
All my classes are online. I found it really helpful, helpful for me as like a student athlete, not having to rush to class or hurry back from class to try to make it to practice or miss class to get to a game. It's, it's all right in front of me on my laptop. I just open up my computer. I just work on my own at my own time and I found that really helpful. I get to take care of my body and you know, my physical and my mental health all while still you know, doing my homework and class and everything like that. So I, I love online classes. I think that is the best fit for me. So 9.30 this morning, we went into our individual hitting. We started off over in the cages. We worked a lot of our drill work, which is like staying connected with our hands, as you see in like the connection ball drill. Front toss and then another tennis ball drills, another connection drill. A lot of the things we're working on right now is staying connected. I think this is the best I've ever hit out of all my fall seasons, and it, it, it feels good. Coming into college, I wasn't so confident um, in my hitting. I was like, I know I can play defense. I just got to get on base somehow, whether it's a bunt or hit, but I wasn't a strong power hitter. And then right now, I think this is the most I've ever hit home runs in my entire life, and we haven't even started the season yet, so I'm excited. We have our softball field. I think our field is absolutely beautiful, um, and we're also getting some renovations on it right now, so we're completely redoing our dugouts, um, which I, I think is going to look amazing. I'm pretty sure it's going underground, so it's going to echo a little bit. You'll be able to hear us a little bit more. Um, the weight room is huge. It's uh, it's, it's very eye-opening coming from like a smaller school and not seeing, you know, many racks or anything like that. You have like one treadmill, you know, um, a squat rack, anything like that. But you go in there and there's like 20 of them, probably 30, I think. The UNT women's softball team, it's amazing. The girls we have right now, this is the closest I think we've ever been as a team. One, two, three. Hey guys, I'm here with the Molly Rainey. Hello. What position do you play? I play outfield. What, what year are you? I'm a fifth year senior baby. She's a super duper senior. <laughs> Who am I here with? I'm Emma. What was that? I'm Emma Jean. <laughs> what position do you play, Emma? I play second base. Do you have any special nicknames? No. You have poopy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> After our individual hitting, I'm going to go head home. I'm going to probably eat some more breakfast, have some fruit, some more coffee. <laughs> Um, and then catch up on my studying. I have only have four classes this semester, so I usually take at least like one day to like really focus in on one class and get my coursework done for that class in the day. I have about two to three hours to study before I get ready and I go to our team practice at 2.30. After practice, we will go straight into weights. <laughs> we'll start our stretches, wait for everybody to get in there, we'll huddle up, we'll talk about what we're doing for the day, and then we'll break up, and then you start doing your pre-work. Um, so it's like correctional work, you get your body moving, mobility stuff, and then we'll start on our major lifts. It could either be deadlifts or back squats, hang cleans. Okay. Hey guys, thanks for joining me on my day in the life at UNT. Go Mean Green! You've come such a long way, Miko. One, two, three. Mom, Dad, Mom, Dad, I got it. I got it. Right, mom. I have. <laughs>